Yep, third lecture. Yeah, now we're going to get more formal and set up some formalism and uh, see how far we go. Thanks, Miriam. <coughs> so now we're going to turn the clock back to 1995 when the TASI was uh, called QCD and Beyond. And ironically, this is more or less how I started my 1995 uh, lectures, which uh, tells you uh, that uh, some things never change, right? Uh, so. Uh, in, the, in this lecture, I want to start by going through just sort of the basic uh, language that people use in amplitudes to describe the uh, color factors and then, and then the basic kinematic variables uh, and how they come into play. And uh, there's a actually th th this first part of it where we develop the trace basis. I'm going to use some graphical notation for doing the group theory, which I think is pretty convenient. And it's uh, sometimes called bird tracks. In fact, there's a, a book uh, related to that by Predrag Svetanovich, whose name is more or less Miriam's last name, but you have to put a few more letters in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. OK. May maybe there's a big difference having a few more letters in <laughs> Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> my apologies. Um, anyway, and I also have this is also in my '95 TASI lectures. If you want to read it there, and maybe a few other places. So the uh, basic idea was we're we're gonna for simplicity we don't have to do that in this formalism, but for simplicity, as I mentioned last time, we're gonna do theories that are all adjoint uh, represent. So that would include pure glue, but also N equals 4 super Yang Mills has only adjoint particles in it. Um, and, and then all the vertices are going to be structure constants, FABC. But nevertheless, we're going to introduce a uh, fundamental representation so that if we wanted to apply it to quarks too, it wouldn't be any problem. And we're going to sort of break up the uh, adjoint representation into fundamentals. This is, I should also say that this is also uh, related to the uh, double line formalism, <coughs> which was uh, these first, uh, uh, Tuft uh, worked on, developed that in the 70s. So anyway, um, we have that the adjoint, and this is adapted to SUNC, where the adjoint is um, just the uh, NC, the fundamental representation tensor, the anti-fundamental, but you have to take out the uh, singlet. Everybody happy with that? OK, so then we're going to just write down all the uh, group theory ob uh, objects. Um, using sort of Feynman diagram notation for what the corresponding things would be. So this looks like a quark line, but here all it represents is the color factor you would put in for a quark line, which is a delta function that shuttles the uh, n index. I runs from 1 to n, and uh, j runs from 1 to n. nc, the number of colors. And uh, of course, a runs from 1 to nc squared minus 1. And then this thing that looks like a gluon propagator, that's just the color part of the gluon propagator, delta AB. So that's the uh, quadratic part. And then for the interactions, <coughs> this will be TA IJ. And that 
here when I write T, I mean the generator in the fundamental representation, because that's what this line is. And this adjoint index coming off, this is how we write down the generator in the fundamental. And then we're going to write, uh, um, <coughs> so then using the uh, definition of the structure constants, um, usually you don't have this square root of 2 in here. Usually the generators are normalized uh, slightly differently. We're going to normalize these generators so that their trace has no half in it. Normally there's a half here. So these things are bigger than the normal ones by a square root of 2. So this would be the standard structure constant. But in fact, we're going to just sort of take out the square root of 2 and the i and redefine some f tilde, which uh, incorporates that. So now I'm going to take this equation and I'm going to trace it. I'm going to multiply it by td and take the trace. So then uh, using that, you can see that fabc is just the trace of ta, tb commutator, tc, or uh, So how would we write that equation graphically? <coughs> we want FABC to have a graphical depiction using the three gluon vertex, which has an FABC in it. And, but now we can rewrite it as um, So the, just the two terms in this equation <coughs> are the two terms here. In other words, TA, according to this graphical rule, just looks like this diagram with an arrow line connecting to a, you know, a gluonic and adjoint type line that comes out and gives you the TA. And then you take that matrix, that's, this is a matrix, you multiply it by TB in the order that this arrow is going around, and then by TC. And then you contract it back up again. That's making the trace. So this is just a graphical representation of the product of the trace of these three matrices. And then I subtract off the same diagram with the arrow reversed. When the arrow is reversed, then I go through the three matrices in the opposite cyclic order, B, A, C, instead of A, B, C. This is in the opposite direction. So does that make sense to people? It's just a handy way to do a lot of the color algebra. And, and there's uh, one more equation that is very useful, which is <coughs> that the, uh, we need to sort of convert the gluon propagator into this. Uh, if you think of a gluon coming in here, it, it looks like it, or an adjoint particle, it looks like it's splitting into a fundamental and an anti-fundamental. But we have to be a little careful because the adjoint is not exactly a fundamental times an anti-fundamental. We have to remove a singlet. So the way we do that is we write this equation here that says uh, if we have two pairs of fundamentals and anti-fundamentals that are connected by an adjoint, the um, role of that, uh, or we can rewrite that as a, as a tensor structure in this space that has two fundamentals and two anti-fundamentals in it. But to do that, we have to write this kind of uh, hairpin structure. 
Now, how do I know that I have this coefficient right? What's the job of this projector? Yeah, exactly. Very good. So, so this thing is standing for a, a sum over TAs um, in this bifundamental. And we know that in SUN, the trace of TA is zero, so I should be projecting out the trace. And the way I can do that is to trace over these indices. So I take this equation diag diagrammatically, take this whole equation, and I stick this on the right-hand side, which is kind of like a delta ij bar on these two indices. And I should also tell you one other thing, that when we've, uh, <coughs> that the dimension of the representation is, is um, nc of the fundamental representation. And therefore, if you make a circle, that's doing the trace of the identity with no generators on it, right? So that, that's nc. So then we take this equation here and we see that this becomes, when I contract it with this on the right, I get a hairpin from adding this on the right to this. And then I get minus 1 over nc times this short hairpin. And then I contract this. And this closed loop, that's just nc. That cancels this and then I get zero. So that's how I check that I have this minus 1 over nc normalized right. Now, actually, this is just a little exercise to show you how some of this tensor algebra works. In fact, if I'm just doing adjoint uh, amplitudes with FABCs in them, I don't need to use this term at all, this minus 1 over nc term. Can anybody see why that might be the case? Suppose I take this equation with the FABC in it, and I uh, <coughs> basically plug in this term. So we're going to take uh, some diagram like this, and we're going to imagine we're coupling to some other vertex. And we're going to have a term that goes over like this, that comes from this term in the propagator. And then we're going to have minus 1 over nc times um, this. So you see what I did? I took this propagator here, and I graphically replaced it by something that shuttles these lines over. And then I subtract off a 1 over nc times this short circuit. But Every time I have one of these, if it came from an FABC, there's another term exactly the same where I reverse the arrow. Now, what happens if I reverse the arrow on this bubble and I add it with the minus sign? It cancels it off because this bubble, you know, you can flip it over and it doesn't care which way the arrow is going. If you have three things sticking out, it cares which way the arrow is going. Okay, so... So uh, actually, for all adjoint uh, drop minus 1 over nc, you can always do that. What this is really saying is that the FABC is a structure constant between non-abelian generators. When we look at this trace part, that's like a U1 factor. It's like the identity matrix, which you could add to the n by n matrices, but it commutes with all of them. And therefore, the structure constants of that U1 with the uh, SUNs vanish. That, that's all we're really saying here. OK. Any questions about that? Yeah. This one here. Yeah. The purpose of this equation is to say that um, <coughs> a gluon propagator is almost, uh, it, it, you know, it can, the adjoint representation can be thought of as being inside the n cross n bar representation. 
and up to 1 over n corrections, it's just uh, the kind of describes essentially all those states. But you have to remove the singlet state. And the singlet state, you can see propagating down here is nothing because there's, there are no indices moving this way. There's a delta function that, that is uh, projecting. This would project into the singlet if you normalized it right. But now we're using it to remove the singlet. And the way we know we removed the singlet correctly is by taking this bracket equation and multiplying it graphically on the right with something that performs the trace operation, a delta ij that contracts those indices. And then we went through this little algebra to check that this, this really stands for the trace of this generator A here, this piece of it here. So we just checked that that was zero that we successfully removed the singlet with the right normalization. Sure. Any other questions? Once you understand this graphical stuff, it's very easy to do it fast. But this is the first time you've seen it, so you've got to slow me down if I say something too fast. Okay, so now we're going to show that all tree graphs with only adjoint interactions have a special form within this trace basis. They will amount to just a single trace of, uh, of these fundamental matrices. So it's really enough to kind of look at one Feynman diagram to see why that works. So there's a all adjoint Feynman diagram. This is just the color factors. This just represents three FABCs. And I probably should have put A1, A2, A3, but I'm lazy. I just put 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 for the, for the colors of the five external states. So what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to plug in <coughs> this representation at each of the three vertices. I have two choices for each vertex. So altogether, there would be two to the three or eight terms. I'm just going to write down two of them. So I always write down the first term where, where all the circles are going clockwise. Okay, but now I want to do the uh, Fiertz. Well, maybe I'll do, I'll draw a little more here. Oh, I don't need to draw. So all these guys are going clockwise. But now I want to use that uh, propagator with the two parallel lines to bring this index over here. And then this one goes this way. So I got everything lined up because this arrow comes here and it goes over and hits this arrow. Which it has, to, the arrows always have to line up because there's a direction to the fundamental representation. It's a complex representation. And then this one comes in here. And let me do this one next. So these line up. Okay, so this contribution is a single trace. It's a trace in the order 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's what, that's what a single closed loop with an arrow on it means. It means a trace of these generators. And in this case, it exactly matches the cyclic ordering. Now let's suppose we went to this vertex and we took the second term. But maybe I should ask, is that clear to everybody? Oh, because uh, each term I'm going to substitute in this expansion. So I have two choices of which term I take. The term with the plus sign and everything going clockwise or the term with the minus sign and everything going counterclockwise. I have that choice at three different vertices. So I have two cubed uh, different terms with plus and minus signs. So let's just suppose that now, now that we've used all the clockwise guys, let's make one of them counterclockwise. That would cost us a minus sign. The left part of the diagram looks exactly the same. But now, when it comes time to line up the arrows, which are the, I'm just copying them from over here. 
This, this guy wants to go over here, and this guy wants to come over here. Still a single trace, right? It's still one closed loop, but there's this little twist in it. So um, this, is, this term will be trace of, again, there's a little shorthand here. I'm not writing all the A's to save time, but it's the generator matrices for the external states in the ordering one, two, three, four, five. And here we got, uh, say, T1, T2, T4, T3, T5. Because we go 1, 2, 4, 3, 5 as we follow around here. Okay, you can do the other six terms at home. <laughs> anyway, you're just going to get the same thing. You're just going to get some twisted up thing. But it, it's pretty obvious that you only generate one, one trace. And uh, so... We have uh, we basically derived the following the tree level trace based uh, decomposition. So I'm going to just write it down here. Um, so these these are supposed to be curly A's, uh, and we call these the full amplitude, or sometimes we call it the the color dressed um, amp. So at tree level, if we have something that depends on a set of momenta, so these are the momenta, these will be the helicities, if they were gluons just be plus or minus one, and then there's some color labels. We usually pull out a factor of the gauge coupling, G. Um, and then we have to sum over all the possible trace structures. And they are characterized by permutations that live in the group Sn, the total permutations, divided out by the cyclic permutations. So we can uh, apply these permutations to the labels here. Um, But we don't need to permute the last label. And then we can write down and we usually write the helicities as superscripts above the shorthand for the momentum, which is just the index one. So this is sigma applied to label one. And coming along with that is the helicity label. Sorry, I ran out of room. Keep doing this index list. And then the last guy doesn't need to be permuted. OK, so this is the color dressed amplitude. It has all of the adjoint labels on it, these AIs. And all the color dependence ends up in these T matrices. So this thing has no. Uh, color uh, uh, indices on it. So it's sometimes called color stripped amplitudes or sometimes partial uh, or color ordered various terminology. So this is just uh, regular font. This is backslash cal. Okay. So now the question is, does everybody understand how I sort of went from this picture to this picture? Basically says that the only thing possible you can write down are single traces. And this is the whole set of single traces. Why is it the whole set? Because the trace is cyclically invariant. So I can always, no matter what permutation I have, I can always move it so AN is at the last slot. So I should only sum over the non-cyclic, yep. It just means that you should apply it both to the, you should carry the helicity along when you permute the particle around. So, um, for example, um, you might have, uh, uh, let's say that sigma is the permutation that takes two to three to four. 
and back to 2 again. And we want to apply that to uh, sigma 1 to an amplitude that is sigma 1 minus sigma 2 minus, um, uh, let me, let me uh, cycle the first three, uh, <coughs> sigma 3 plus, I'm just giving an example here, 4 plus, that would be equal to A4 tree, A4 tree of um, 2 minus, well, actually, I'm uh, probably, yeah, okay, 3 minus um, 1. I need to move the helicity at the same time um, <coughs> so that it always carries the helicity along with it. In other words, when I take the second slot, for example, and change it to 3, I also have to go look, see what the helicity of 3 was and move it. If you don't do that, you get equations that don't make sense because uh, some of them will have the same particle, will have different helicities. You have got to drag them along. That's all. Do you want a minus one to the um, that happens when you reflect things. No, we don't, we don't need a minus one to the number of permutations here. I mean, partly this is a d definition. I haven't uh, sort of uh, used any symmetries yet. There are, there are, so th there is no minus to the permutation in this formula. Um, well, if you want to get the complete color description of the amplitude, it will involve a sum over these color ordered objects. And you can't get away with just having one cyclic ordering. That's just one piece of the amplitude. However, we, we like to work with amplitudes with a definite cyclic ordering, 1 to n, because it, it, it uh, simplifies which are the important variables in our mind. But then to reconstruct the whole amplitude, we, we apply permutations to those formulas when we need to. Right. Th this is... I just showed you one diagram, and then I said, generalizing from this, you can see that all tree diagrams get single traces. But I didn't tell you what order those traces were going to come out in. And in the full amplitude, they're going to come out in all different orders, modulo the fact that we have cyclic permutations. Actually, one thing you might be thinking of in that question is, why did we sum over a trace and the reverse trace? Because those coefficients are related to each other. It's true. That, that's an option. You could divide out by that. And then you would, if you removed the, re, the re reflections as well as the cyclic ones, then you'd have to be careful about those signs. And it's just conventional to write it this way, even though it's an overcount. This, this count has a n minus 1 factorial. It's possible to use that symmetry to remove it to n minus 1 factorial over 2. However, I'm going to show you that, in fact, there are other relations that take at least this part down to n minus 2 factorial. So these things are, are not all independent. There are algebraic relations among them. And then there's some other relations. So this is sort of group theory. And then there, later we come to the BCJ relations, which take it to n minus 3 factorial. Okay, now at the moment I didn't really tell you anything about why this is a good idea or, or uh, what are the properties of these things. But the most important properties are that um, if we take the standard cyclic ordering, and if I don't care about the helicities, I just won't write them down, but... Uh, 
<coughs> because it holds helicity by helicity. But this gets, um, this is only from ordered, uh, or let's call it uh, planar uh, Feynman diagrams. with um, uh, external uh, legs ordered one, one, two, three, around to ends, ordered cyclically. So that's an example of a diagram that produces trace of T1, T2, T3, T4. That is the coefficient, the color coefficient multiplying this kinematic guy in the order 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It also produces some other orderings. But what's important is that if we draw something that is um, um, non-planar, here's a random graph which is not planar once I've fixed the external ordering, okay? This line goes underneath this line. So this uh, one here, when you expand out this trace, it's going to have a bunch of stuff. And then it's either going to have T3 next to T5 or T5 next to T3. Because leg 3 and leg 5 both go into that vertex. See, leg three and leg five, because of this non-planarity, five can come over here and attach to the diagram right next to three. And then when you expand this out into the trace, three and five are going to have to be next to each other in the trace. Because whenever we looked at a three vertex, it always coupled together two cyclically adjacent uh, guys, or two of the guys that it coupled to. So you see this... Uh, uh, means that we're never going to get the ordering 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So A, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 does not get any contributions from this Feynman diagram. It only gets contributions from diagrams that are planar. They look more or less like this, or you can kind of rotate this around and, and rearrange it by moving things in the plane. Yep, question? Well, I want to be careful to say, yeah, that this is planar with punctures, you know, where you have to put those points in a ordering or or in a sector, sort of. So I agree, it's a little different because of these puncturing. Okay. In any case, the fact that these only get contributions from planar diagrams simplifies their analytic structure enormously um, because what we want to do is we want to analyze what happens when uh, momenta have special configurations and that's the uh, notion of uh, factorization. Of course there are many different uses of the term factorization what I, what I mean is that there are kinematic configurations where amplitudes fall apart into uh, typically two uh, almost disconnected pieces. So suppose we have a a big amplitude like this and we arrange things so that um, K1, K2 up to Kp
is almost light-like. Then this, this uh, composite momentum, the sum of these things, is going to zero, and so we can expect that this process is going to split into two processes that know almost nothing about each other. In other words, particles scatter here, and then there's an internal particle that can emerge from this scattering process, travel to Alpha Centauri, and then participate in this scattering process. In practice, we never get the two as far apart as Alpha Centauri, but uh, we can do it as a thought experiment. So, so this is the notion of factorization, that when you have a situation like this, this amplitude a n, this is a p plus 1, and there's actually sort of two extra legs here, so this is probably n minus p plus 1. So a n in this limit factorizes into a n minus p plus 1 times a p plus 1. And then there's a 1 over this momentum, which is getting very big, that controls the singularity of the amplitude in this limit as a case where it goes to zero. Now, we should be slightly more careful because there might be, in gauge theory, two states propagating down this pipe. There might be a plus solicity state and a minus solicity state. And I haven't talked too much about the the uh, helicity formalism, but we always label these states as if they were outgoing. So if this state is plus and it's going out, now I want to view it from the other side. So now it's going the other direction. It's the same state, but I'm reversing its momentum to think of it as, income, as outgoing from the point of view of the other guy. If I do that, then, then what? if it was helicity plus before, now it's helicity minus, because the angular momentum is the same. I just changed the momentum. So then whenever we draw these factorization things, we put little helicities here to tell us which state propagates, because in many simple cases, only one of them does. And then it has to be the opposite helicity on the other side, because of this all outgoing labeling convention. I didn't bother labeling all these with pluses and minuses but I could have. So th there will be a, really be a sum over uh, h sub k equals plus or minus um, k to the h here. And this amplitude will have argument minus k to the minus h. And there will be a bunch of other arguments. So there will be a, a discrete sum in this case. Okay, so we talked about color ordering. We talked about factorization. Factorization controls where the poles are in these amplitudes. If I have a color ordered amplitude so that all of these guys are cyclically ordered, then I have a, a much more limited set of poles that I can have. So if it's color ordered, then we only get poles in sums of cyclically adjacent um, uh, momenta. So for example, starting at ki, ki plus 1, up to K, uh, kj. We'll usually write this as si, i plus 1 to J or something. So one of the games in amplitudes is to understand the analytic properties of all the things you're studying in order to use that to simplify their computation. And this color, the purpose of this color ordering is that well, you guys like entanglement, but we like disentanglement. We want to disentangle the kinematic variables so that the only certain sets appear in this piece, certain sets appear in this piece. When you sum over all permutations, you get them all back in the end, but study each piece separately. 
Any questions about that? Okay. So what's going to happen at one loop? Any guesses? Now, some, some of you guys are ringers, and you know the answer already. So I need an answer from somebody who uh, has never looked at this before. What's going to happen if we take a loop diagram and start stuffing in these, these traces? Yeah, that's good. Very good. We're going to get, at one loop, we're going to get um, NC times single traces. But that's not all. Any other guesses for what we might get? Yeah, good. So the second thing you can get are double traces. So we can very quickly uh, illustrate that with the simplest one loop real scattering, which would be four points. So the leading color term comes when you take all these cycles to go in the same direction. And that just shuttles all of the indices around the outside. But then there's the index running the other way, which has nobody to talk to in this term. And you remember what uh, closed arrow uh, arrow line closed loop is. This just stands for NC. So that's the NC that Billy guessed correctly. And then there's the single trace around the outside. But if we reverse some of the arrows, for example, let's reverse the bottom two arrows. So I copy the top structure. But on the bottom, because of the arrows, there, there's a switch from inside to outside. So these were going around clockwise. These are going counterclockwise. So this guy can hook up to here, but this guy has to go inside. So if I rewrite this guy, I see I get it's topologically equivalent to this graph. Uh, and this would be sort of, uh, this is this Kronecker delta. Well, you can see it's a trace with two things sticking off it. In this case, it happens to be, uh, that bubble can be removed because it's the trace of TATB, which is delta AB. But because I want to illustrate the more general thing, just leave it as traces. And if you stick more gluons in, you'll see a lot of terms that have this double trace form. Why double trace? Because there's sort of just two lines going around the loop. You can't find any more lines than that in the case with just adjoints going around the loop. If you go to uh, two loops, you can get triple traces and so on. OK, good. That's one way of doing color. Uh, but there's another way of doing color, which is uh, different. And the fact that there are two ways of doing it lets you derive some identities rather quickly. So let's see, where am I at? I started at 1045. So I have a half hour left or so. Thanks. And I guess it's time to uh, attempt to wash the blackboards again, maybe. So this approach was clearly very uh, adapted to SUNC, and which is no problem if you're a QCD person, or in, because uh, NC equals three is the case you're interested in. But uh, we can also do things in the way that doesn't care which gauge group it is at all. So that's what we're going to do this time.
I probably didn't even use the third board here. Okay, so in this part, we <coughs> forget about all this trace stuff and just use the Jacobi identity. So the idea of this is to identify two legs, say one and n, and the rest of the diagrams, these still represent just the color factors, um, <coughs> are going to be laid out like this, and we're going to systematically simplify the uh, the factors, although we don't have to really keep track of very much. We just have to know that we can reduce all the color factors using the Jacobi identities to a standard form. For example, let's see, here's one. So the goal is to make all the Jacobi, uh, all the color factors look like a half ladder. That'll be something that runs directly from one to n, just spitting a bunch of gluons off on one side. This one's different. It has gluons coming off, but some of them are attached to non-trivial trees. So what are we going to do about that? Well, if you remember, Last time I mentioned that the graphical interpretation, that the Jacobi identity has to do with putting two Fs next to each other and thinking of them as the generators in the adjoint representation. So if we have uh, um, A and B and we have TA adj, TB adj, and then we subtract the same thing with B and A, Remember, these are the same as the structure constants, the adjoint representation. So we subtract off the same thing with uh, A and B attaching in opposite orders. What do we get on the right-hand side? I'm taking the two generator matrices and <coughs> subtracting the reverse ordering. That's the, com the commutator which gives us F, F A B C times the T C edge. So the way we write that is we have an A and a B here, and here's the C, and then we get that. But actually, we're going to use this the other way around. We're going to go from right to left. If we see a non-trivial tree 
sticking up off of this leg, we're going to try to trivialize it by, by going backwards and replacing it by two things which are more directly connected. So here's a complicated tree coming off of this line. So then we just uh, can always rewrite this graph as um, So let me just draw a little circle. Everything stays constant outside of those circles. All I've done is use this identity running from right to left inside the circle. So I took a guy that had a vertical type propagator and I replaced it by two ones where this propagator runs horizontally, but I have to swap it over in one term. So you see, I've simplified this tree, which used to have a more complicated structure into this structure. And now it's pretty obvious I can keep doing this. You know, I can apply the same rule to remove this tree and this tree and this tree. And in general, for any, any tree graph, you can keep iterating this until you get down to uh, something that looks generically like this. Where you just have single stubs. Yep. We're, these are only color factors in this, like this part of this lecture. There's no momenta. All we're trying to do is the same thing we tried to do last time, which was just to categorize what the possible um, uh, color structures were so that we could label each of them with some kinematic object. I didn't yet tell you what the properties of those kinematic objects were. So you can't complain to me about what I've done with the momenta because I'm not touching the momenta. <laughs> yep. Uh, that, that, yeah. So the point is a uh, very good question. I should have said that earlier. We have quartic vertices in Yang-Mills theory. But if you look at them, they're all proportional to products of two FABCs, you know, contracted together. So from the point of the color structure, you just expand them out. This is not a real propagator inside. It's like an auxiliary field. It's something that doesn't have any dynamics. But from the color point of view, it's just two, it still has two structure constants. And the way they're hooked together is like at tree level. So it doesn't, it doesn't destroy any of the arguments. In fact, when you talk about later BCJ relations, we write everything in a cubic graph structure. And then we have to take the four point answer. We got to pretend there was a one over p squared there to assign it to a cubic graph. And in that case, then we, then we have to keep track of the momenta. And we have to remember that that thing gives us something which is p squared over p squared. So we, we, we pretend there's a propagator and something canceling it when we deal with the four point case. But uh, it's important to know that, that that's the, the structure and it's not some other structure that might be more complicated. You could imagine that you could have a vertex that has some kind of quartic casimir, if you know what those things are, and that would disrupt the counting. Th then it, it wouldn't follow the single trace tree level, double trace at loop level anymore. You do what I say. You, you plug in the quartic casimir, there's this thing called the quartic casimir, which is D, A, A, B, C, D. Um, you, can, uh, re you can often rewrite it as a, as a symmetrized single trace and stick it in. But it, um, actually, that's the fundamental one. Um, I mean, again, it depends on whether you're following the SUN route or the more general gauge theory route. Um, 
Actually, what you usually do with it is you, you leave things expressed in terms of those casimirs. When you do a multi-loop QCD calculation, those things start to come up at three or, three or four loops. And then you, you know that, well, anyway, you, you can use the trace basis to reduce things, but you can also often reduce things to quadratic casimirs. But at some point, you can't, and you have these uh, symmetrized uh, adjoint guys. Typically, you leave them in the, in the final result and uh, evaluate them for SUN when you need to. So the uh, last thing I want to do is I just want to fold these guys over just to put them in a standard form. That costs me a minus sign because of the um, anti-symmetry because FABC is totally anti-symmetric. But again, I don't care because I wasn't tracking what was multiplying these color factors. I was just classifying all the color factors. So then at the end of the day, we get 1 here and here. And then you could get a generic uh, permutations of the legs between 1 and n. So, so I need to put this down. So we've just derived a second color representation, which says that backslash cal a n tree with the same arguments I wrote down before is uh, g to the n minus 2 sigma now belongs to the total, the permutation group on n minus 2 elements. And then we write, uh, um, I'm going to write it in the following way. We can think of it as an operator that goes between A1 and AN and, ha and uh, has the adjoint generators and spits out these indices sigma 2 to sigma n minus 1. Okay, so we have a second formula. At first sight, it looks totally different from the first formula. So I put a prime on these coefficients because they might be completely different functions from the an trees I defined using the color ordering framework. <clears throat> but in fact, they're exactly the same. The an tree primes are exactly the same as the an trees. And uh, the easiest way to see this is, again, with this graphical. Uh, so an prime is equal to an. And to see that, you want to take this and contract, multiply by uh, by a trace in a, this reference ordering A1, A2, up to An. And then sum over all the adjoint indices. So as usual, I'm going to do this graphically, because you guys are all experts in this now. I know it came at you pretty fast, but. This is the full color amplitude. This is the color structure, which we showed had to live in this smaller space where um, 1 and n are at the opposite ends of this half ladder. Well, these depend on momenta. But for the moment, I just wrote down a generic uh, function called a n prime tree. But now I want to tell you that a n prime tree is the same as the coefficients I had before. I'll show you. So this is the same thing. And this has a lot of color indices on it. But I, it's still the same thing as it was in the other thing, uh, the other equation. So I could take both sides and uh, perform the same manipulation on them. And the manipulation I'm going to perform is to multiply them by 
this fixed uh, um, trace, and then sum over all n adjoint indices that are connecting the two. So, so here's a whole bunch of uh, adjoint indices a1 to an, and here's the trace in the other formula, and here's this trace. This is actually I'm drawing the color contraction for one term in the other formula, which is where the cycle lines up exactly with this. This trace has a, and now I'm going to consider the limit nc goes to infinity. I can do that because the equations I'm trying to get, these things don't have any nc dependence in them. So when I take nc to infinity, I get an nc to the n if these lines all line up. Now this looks more like something you recognize as a definition of planar and what you're more used to. But as soon as I switch and cross any guys so I have a different permutation, this, this is order uh, nc to the n minus 2 at most. And so it's suppressed. So by doing this, I'm going to pick out exactly the an tree in the other formula. So this projects out um, an tree 1 to n in the color in the trace base formula. But then I just go through and do the same manipulation on this side where I have this color structure. I contract it with a ordering and if the ordering is the unpermuted one, the six, one to n, then once again I get a nc to the n. But if I screwed up and chose any other permutation, then I get a non-planar graph. And if you work out all the the uh, rules, <coughs> you get again order nc to the n minus two. Sorry if you can't see that. So these cross guys are all suppressed. So by tracing with this on both sides, I just project out the uh, uh, an and an prime respectively. And therefore, they must be equal to each other. So by the principle of computation by erasure, I can get that equation. Any questions about that? Well, that's the thing, is that they don't depend on NC. The coefficients don't depend on NC. So I was able to use a trick of considering NC goes to infinity, but the conclusions are equally valid for any value of the gauge group because there aren't any NCs in them. If you go to the multi-loop level and identify certain trace structures, they can have subleading terms in 1 over nc squared, but this is a tree level argument, so there, there's just no nc dependence inside those things. <coughs> okay, so we have one formula that says there are n minus 1 factorial things, and another formula that says there are only n minus 2 factorial things. Therefore, there must be some relation among the n minus 1 factorial things. There's too many of them. So how do we get those relations? Well, we take this color structure here and we just go through and expand it out in the trace basis using those diagrammatic rules. And um, what you find if we have it in this ordering in this standard ordering here, um, <coughs> and we plug in our favorite formula, with arrows going one way and arrows going the other way, We're going to get a single trace, because after all, it's tree level. But the uh, form of it, K 
can be written something like this. Here's A1. Here's the single trace. Here's AN. So I've divided the this set here from 2 to n minus 1 into two sets, alpha and beta. And the property is that um, A2 to A n minus 1 has to be contained in um, a set of sets which is written like this. So <coughs> this is called the shuffle operation. The shuffle operation or sometimes merge um, implies that it preserves order within Alpha, within the two arguments, alpha and this beta transpose. Beta transpose means beta in the reverse order. Take the elements of beta and reverse the order. So, um, so then I need to explain this. So anyway, first of all, the reason it's called shuffle is because you have two decks of cards, alpha and beta transpose, and you shuffle them. Then it preserves the ordering of the two individual sets, but can interleave them in a lot of different ways. So why does this set here have to appear as one of these shuffles or merges? Well, that's because um, when we went this direction, we the beta guys came whenever we took, the alpha guys came whenever you took a clockwise guy. Then they sort of coupled to the, the top of the loop, whereas the beta guys reach under couple to the bottom of the loop. Then I fold the beta guys down to simplify things, providing a factor of minus one to the number I had to put down. And now their order gets reversed because on the trace they're coming around on the back side. So that's why I had the transpose. But apart from that, the alphas and the betas have to be in the order that we found them in the, in the first case. The betas dropped out of this trace and they went over on the other side, but the alphas are still in the same order. So this is uh, the identity that you have, is that you get, I should have put here, a sum over sigma belonging to uh, this uh, merge operation. Okay, so that's really all you need to then identify the coefficients and uh, derive a relation that says that a n tree of uh, 1 alpha n beta, that's sort of stuff on this side, is equal to minus 1 to the beta times the sum over this uh, sigma belonging to alpha shuffle or merge beta transpose a n tree one sigma two sigma n minus one n. So using the cyclic properties of the trace, we could reduce things to ones that just had n at the back. But using the this group theory uh, derivation, we can make sure that any two that we want are next to each other. And that's sort of why we only have n minus 2 factorial things to consider. And uh, next time the BCJ relations will actually show us that there are some very similar relations to these. these I should have said these are called the, uh, the kleiss coif relations. And they go back to 1989. Whereas the BCJ relations date from this millennium. 
uh, like 2008. Anyway, they have a similar, superficially similar structure, except they will have kinematic factors in the relation. This relation has no kinematic dependence, right? It just has plus or minus signs in the linear relation. The BCJ relations have some kinematic dependence in them, and so they're more deep and dynamical than these relations. And they will reduce things to n minus 3 factorial. So you can put any three you want in a row and get everything else from those. They also have a derivation from string theory. But I want before I get to those, I want to do some more. I need to talk about kinematics in the last five minutes. I need to get started on that. Any questions before I leave color for kinematics? Okay. Kinematics deserves a new stick of chalk. Okay, basically, uh, for uh, massless particles, <coughs> you should not use four vectors. You, you should uh, trade them for two component spinners. That's the bottom line. Remember the Pauli matrices. Sigma mu alpha alpha dot, where sigma zero is the identity matrix, sigma x, sigma y, What happens if we take uh, the momentum vector k mu and contract it with uh, sigma mu alpha alpha dot? We get a matrix, which we call k alpha alpha dot, and we can easily write it out. <coughs> it has k0 plus kz and k0 minus kz, where this is the energy, and uh, kx plus iky, kx minus iky. And so the cool thing about this is that its determinant is um, is the momentum squared, which is zero for massless particles. So if you have a two by two uh, matrix with vanishing determinant, it must be um, a product of row times column vectors because the determinant vanishes. So let's just write down those, uh, let's just call those row vectors, column vectors lambda and lambda tilde. So these actually are uh, identified with at least for the case where k is a moment. Th this is a little bit, this is a Dirac spinner. This is a right-handed projector. That's really lives in a four-dimensional space, but you know it can really be represented as a two-component spinner, and that's what lambda alpha is. Whereas lambda alpha dot, so let me just put right-handed, right, right -handed, uh, and then uh, left-handed degrees of freedom are represented by lambda tilde alpha dot. And also, um, if k is real, if, if the vector k mu is real, then because the Pauli matrices are Hermitian, uh, this thing will be Hermitian. But that means that the transpose, which exchanges row and column, conjugates things. So k mu being real is equivalent to lambda alpha dot obeying a conjugation plus or minus some convention.
Okay, so we're going to use the lambdas and the lambda tildes for the most part instead of the k's because everything is much more uh, much more simplified in terms of them. So, uh, for example, momentum conservation. The sum of all the momenta are zero. We can contract that sum with the sigma matrices, rewrite it as k alpha alpha dot, and factorize it. I should probably just say, though, that when we have a lambda that corresponds to uh, ki, it's, uh, we just put the i in there. And the same thing for lambda alpha dot. We just use the momentum label. So then momentum conservation becomes sum over i equals 1 to n lambda i alpha lambda tilde i alpha dot is equal to 0. <coughs> now, the two component spinners aren't Lorentz invariant, but we can, we can use the uh, Levi-Civita tensor. for the two-dimensional two um, and on these two-dimensional indices. So this is just the anti-symmetric tensor on two indices to construct invariants. So let me just write those down and then I'll bring this to a close. So we define epsilon. So these things occur all over the place. And so we just write them as these uh, angle brackets. And uh, they are anti-symmetric because of the property of the Levi-Civita tensor. And in particular, I, I is 0. And similarly, we have to define ones with dotted indices that connect together the two lambda tildes. And these are defined by square brackets. And again, they're anti-symmetric. Um, the uh, spinners are commuting, yeah. They're not fields, they're uh, just functions. Okay, so there's some other uh, properties of these. Okay, one, one last property and then we'll quit. Which is that uh, ij, ji, has a couple epsilons in it, and then some lambdas and lambda tildes. And this thing you'll recognize as k slash j. I mean, there's different ways to do this, but one is to use as a crutch what you remember from Dirac algebra, and you have a k slash um, J here, a K slash I here, and you're actually doing a direct trace over it, which has uh, actually one half of KI slash KJ slash. So this works out to be 2KI dot KJ. Since everything's massless, this is the invariant SIJ. So let me just rewrite that here. Because it's an important formula. If, if the k's are real, then uh, ij is um, plus or minus ij star because of the condition that we found on the lambdas and lambda tildes that enter these products. So if this is, this, if this is the complex conjugate of that and they multiply together to give this, then uh, for real momenta, ij is the square root of Sij e to the plus or minus some phase angle. The reason this is so important comes back to what we were talking about with the collinear limits. In the collinear limits, because of this angular momentum suppression, the amplitudes always go like square roots of uh, the invariance in the denominator. And they also have some azimuthal behavior because of the violation of angular momentum conservation. And so these spinner products turn out to be perfect to capture the collinear behavior. And so all the amplitude, helicity amplitudes look very simple written in terms of these spinner products. And they also 
allow us to do some tricks with complex kinematics, which we'll talk about next time. Questions with short answers? No, it's the answers that have to be short. The questions are always short. Yep. So, these properties are only true on shell. How does this come up with on shell? Yeah, well, that's sort of the purpose of the rest of the lectures. <laughs> but basically, we, we want to use analyticity to deduce off shell properties from on shell properties. So, the BCFW recursion relations, which we should get to next lecture, are essentially um, using analyticity of a meromorphic function in the complex plane and Cauchy's theorem to reconstruct the function at a particular point um, where internal propagators may be off shell by going to other points in the complex plane where selected propagators go on shell. And then we can use the factorization uh, idea that I mentioned. I sort of showed it for real kinematics, but it holds for complex kinematics. And, and so that will tell us what the residues are, just to sketch how that's going to work. And then when you go to the loop level, you kind of do similar things. You talk about the loop integrand as some rational function of the loop momenta. But maybe it's too complicated to analyze, so you push it into a you, you discuss one parameter complex variations and do one. I mean, actually, people do analyze it in multidimensional complex uh, variable type analysis. So, analyticity lets you go from on shell to off shell, in a nutshell, so to speak. Sure.